morning and appreciate the worship and those who've led in it so far. And uh, as we come before the throne of God, we're going to be looking at His Word in Luke chapter 10. The Good Samaritan is certainly one of the most well-known and most beloved parables out there. And it is a great parable for preaching, for teaching. Uh, There are some good, obvious lessons that come out of it. But all the parables, or almost all the parables that Jesus told that we read in Scripture, we find a context for why Jesus told that parable. It's not that just he was telling these stories and they were just hanging out there and, you know, you figure it out and get a lesson out of this. There was a context, there was a reason why he told that story. And if you go up just a few verses ahead of what Mike read to us in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, we get the context for this parable. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? And he answered, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. Now, the context tells us just right off the bat that this is a challenge to Jesus. Because it says clearly that this teacher of the law, this expert in the law, he stood up to test him. I'm going to throw something in front of Jesus and see if he answers this the way that he's supposed to answer it. And Jesus' answer, it was straight out of the Old Testament. I mean, this answer, the teacher of the law, he knew this. This was no surprise to him. Deuteronomy chapter 6, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And straight out of Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. He knew this. And it was out of that context that this parable began to flow. Now what I want us to do to focus our time on this morning is not so much just the parable itself as that context. Because that context is so very, very, very important for us understanding the question that was asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer, the clear answer to that is love God, love others, Love yourself. Now, growing up, I always heard that paradigm of love God, love others, love yourself. And this is the way that it was kind of explained to me. It was this idea that, i got to actually turn it on, then it'll work. There we go. It was this idea that God's up here. And God is great, and God is good, and Everything points to God, and that is true. And then, below that comes others. And it is our job and our duty as Christians to do everything that we can to serve others and to to do for others. And then, maybe, just maybe, If there's any kind of little crumbs left over down here, then you can do something for yourself. But you got to be really careful about that because you can't think too highly of yourself, right? And here's the thing. I think that's a really spiritually unhealthy way of thinking about what Jesus is talking about here. Because you see, what I've come to understand is that there is an interconnectedness between these things that enhance and build each other up rather than diminish each other in any way. You see, it's, it's not a tiered thing, but it's an amazing interconnectedness. And this interconnectedness requires that we see all of these things and that we see that there's balance in all these things, or I think we miss the point of why Jesus mentions all three of those things. And so I want to kind of work through what does this mean to love God, to love others, and to love self? What does it mean to love God? Well, Jesus' description is of a totality 
of love. It's heart, mind, it's soul, it's strength. It is every fiber of your being. It is a love that redefines your world. It changes how you act, how you speak. It changes everything that flows out of you. That's what it means to love God because that love of God is so deeply connected into who we are. And our love of God is always to be rooted in knowing Christ and knowing the Word. John 15, 10, Jesus says plainly, If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and I remain in His love. So, so there's this idea of, yes, Jesus is calling us to obedience, to knowing the Word, to being in Christ. But we have to be careful that our love for God doesn't become skewed by a legalistic drive for perfection. Loving God says, I want to know God so that I can be in a relationship with God. Being legalistic says, I want to know about God so that I can make sure that I check all of the right boxes. When we love God in a legalistic way, we are actually denying God because what we're saying is, if I follow all of these rules perfectly, then by my own power, I have earned my salvation. And I don't need you, God, and I don't need Jesus, other than lip service. So we've got to be careful about that our pursuit of God is to know God and to be in relationship with God, and that's what it is to love God. The covenant relationship and covenant love always come before expectations. Now let me say that again. Covenant love and covenant relationship always comes before expectations. And here's what that means. God doesn't love you because you followed a bunch of rules to perfection. God loves you because you are his son and because you are his daughter. God loves you when you're broken and messed up. God loves you when you fail. You can't separate yourself from the love of God. That's what it means to love God, to understand that. Can we love God too much? Can we obey God too much? No. But we can love God wrong. Think about what Jesus communicated in this parable, in this passage about love for God. You see, there's this man who's hurt and the priest and the Levite love God very much. But they walk right by. Because they're loving God not in this covenant relationship way of I want to know God, I want to be in relationship with God. They're loving God in this way of I got to follow all the rules just right. And so a priest and a Levite, here's a guy on the side of the road. He's hurt. He may be dead. I can't go over and touch this guy because then I will be unclean. And I can't do my duties in the temple if I'm unclean. And if I slow down to help this guy, well, good grief, I might be late. And how awful would that be for me to be late if I'm the presiding priest? And yet in their checking the boxes desire to love God, they totally, completely missed what it was to love God and, and, and the idea that loving God means we love others. That is the visible demonstration of our love for God, how we love others. So what does it mean to love others? And th this is the question. This is the question that the guy asked, that the teacher of the law, he said, you know, who's my neighbor? Who are these others that I'm supposed to love? And it's interesting in the text that the way that he introduces this is he says, but he wanted to justify himself. And so he asked, who's my neighbor? You know, there's that loaded word, but. And so what the teacher of the law wants in this is, is he wants to understand I'm the good guy in this story in this narrative, in this exchange. 
that the way that I'm currently interacting with people and treating people and looking at people, I'm right. I'm the good guy. That's what he wanted to know. And what Jesus does is Jesus absolutely turns his notion of neighbor upside down. He flips it. Because, you see, in, in the story that Jesus told, it wasn't the good guy, the priest or the Levite, the righteous person who stopped and helped. Instead, it was the Samaritan. And if you know anything about the history of the relationship between Jews and Samaritans, Jews looked at Samaritans as dogs. They were half-breeds. They were less than. They didn't deserve God's love. They weren't God's people. And Jesus says, and that's the guy who stopped and helped him. And he tells this good expert in the law, this good Jew, he tells him, now go and do likewise. Isn't that something? He tells this guy, go be like the person who probably you were taught since childhood is no good, is a worthless person. That's who I want you to go and be like. Wow. Wow. In fact, when, when Jesus asked the question about who was a neighbor to the man, uh, I was yesterday my son and I were talking through what I was going to preach today, and I was reading, we were reading through the passage and talking about it, and Holden pointed out, did, did you notice what he said there? When Jesus asked who was a good neighbor to the man, he didn't say the Samaritan. He wouldn't even go there. Well, I suppose it's the one who helped him. But, no, I, I can't be like that. So, how does this translate for us today? Who's our neighbor today? Well, there are so many things that create division between us. Uh, there, there's race, there's economic status, there's politics, religious beliefs, on and on and on the list could go of things that separate us. And it's so easy to look at those things that separate us and point them out and maybe either through fear or through taught prejudice or through whatever reason we say, uh-uh, I can go this far, but no further. What are we doing to break down what Paul refers to as the dividing wall of hostility? And that can be anything from being conscientious of what are you posting on social media? It might be, what are you saying in front of your children? It might be, what are you doing to treat other people that are in your neighborhood or in your workplace or in your school or wherever else as not less than? What are you doing to stand against injustice rather than politicizing it when our brothers and sisters are being denied their, their humanity and being treated as less than? Our love for God is demonstrated in our love for others who are made in the image of God, regardless of politics, position, skin color, gender, any other factor. Who is my neighbor? It's anybody else who's made in the image of God. And that's everybody else. That's what God calls us to in loving our neighbor. Now, the one that is toughest for a lot of people, I think, is this idea of love for self. One of the first questions I ask in just about every first counseling session that I do with somebody is I will ask the question, do you love yourself? And it's amazing. It's amazing the range of answers that I get in asking that question, but that question tells me so much about where we're going to go and what we're going to do and what, what we need to work on. What does it mean to love self? And more significantly, why is that important? Why is it important that we love ourselves? Because, again, in our faith, so many times we're taught over and over and over, deny yourself, deny yourself, deny yourself. And yes, there is a way and a context that we do need to deny ourselves, our selfish nature. But when Jesus told this parable, 
he absolutely said that we need to love ourselves. Love for self, it's not pride, it's not apathy, it's not selfishness, but it's taking care of ourselves, giving ourselves good self-care. And self-care is not just making sure that you exercise, that your body's healthy physically, but it's also caring for, your, for yourself spiritually, caring for yourself emotionally, caring for yourself mentally. And not only did Jesus advocate loving yourself, he also tied it into love for God and love for others. He, he didn't say, love God, love others. He said, love God, love others, love yourself. He brought them all three together, and Jesus practiced good self-care. Jesus practiced good self-love. We see it over and over and over and over through Scripture. If you look at Mark chapter 1, Jesus goes to Peter's mother-in-law's house and he heals her. And then when word gets out, people are bringing all kinds of sick people to Jesus and he heals and he heals and he heals and he heals. And then the next morning when they get up, they go looking for Jesus and they can't find him. And it's because Jesus understands part of self-care is sometimes you've got to back away from the crowd and be by yourself to reconnect with God. And that's exactly what he was doing. But then Jesus demonstrates great self-care again that when they come to him and they say, there are crowds waiting for you. There are lines of people to be healed and we need to get right on over there and get you back to work healing those people. And Jesus says, no. No, we're going to a different town now because that's where God's leading me. That's, I didn't come just to keep working in this one area. Good self-care means that we have boundaries, that there are times that we say no, that there are times that it's okay to walk away from one thing knowing that you know, God's still there, God's still present, that's still going to be taken care of. I don't have to do everything. Jesus reminds us about self-care just a little bit later in Luke chapter 10, the very next section where he's dealing with Mary and Martha. And Jesus comes into their home. Martha is getting everything ready and all the preparations for the people coming in. And Mary, she goes in with the group and she sits down at Jesus' feet to hear the word of God. And Martha comes in and says, Jesus, this ain't fair. I'm doing all this work. And she needs to be out here helping me do all this work. And Jesus' response is a self-care response. Understand, he is not saying that what Martha was doing was unimportant. He's not saying that at all. But what he's saying is Mary's needing to take care of her spiritual self-care right now. And we're not going to take that away from her. And so... Over and over and over, this idea of loving yourself is demonstrated by Jesus. Why is loving yourself important? Loving yourself is important because you too are made in the image of God. We love others because others are made in the image of God, and that's how we demonstrate our love for God by loving others. But we also demonstrate our love for God by loving ourselves because you too are made in the image of God. You know, it's long been understood that you can't truly love someone else unless you love yourself. And I believe that. I believe that to be true. Through good self-care, you make room for God to fill you up, to come into you and fill you up. See, you can only pour so much out of a cup before you have to refill it, right? Right? And loving ourselves means that we let God refill us so that we can then serve others, love God, do those things He's calling us to. If we don't let God fill us up, we continually try to find our worth in busyness and in just doing and doing and doing. And sometimes that's doing for others. But time and time again, I watch so many people, especially uh, in ministry or in leadership roles within churches who just burn out because they're not practicing good self-care too. Love God, love others, love yourself. You know, we are called to this glorious, wonderful relationship with God and with our 
fellow humanity who are made in the image of God. And loving God, loving others, and loving ourselves is the calling that allows us to participate in God's kingdom in a way that will redeem the world back to God. And if any facet of that is missing, if any piece of that is out of whack, out of balance, then, then we have an incomplete witness to the world. We have an incomplete picture of how we can be whole and be who God wants us to be. This morning, be a part of that. Be a part of loving God. Be a part of loving other people with no boundaries, no divisions, no dividing walls of hostility. But also, be a part of loving yourself because you too are a beloved son or daughter of God who deserves to know that and, and to love yourself. And if we can help you in any way this morning with any of those, will you come as we stand and sing this invitation song?